All right, I know I keep talking about cases and how you can't trust them for love nor money. And as a result, we can't trust any of the data related to COVID-19. And that may seem a little of a stretch. And I wanna help you understand why it isn't a stretch at all and how, quite frankly, until we demand uh, an appropriate reform to how cases are defined by the WHO and the respective governments of the world, we're basically hoodwinking the population, interfering, into restricting, into locking down, and into having people submit to the demands of our government with a testing regime that is designed to be flawed. Let me explain what I mean. So we've got 306,000 tests being performed in the UK per day, an eye-watering amount just for one disease type. Well, out of those 306,000 tests, we are finding 11,000 positive, positive tests per day. We're defining those as cases, we're putting them into the COVID dashboard, we're then putting them into the contact tracing database, and we are chasing up these people, isolating, house arresting, whatever you want to call it, 120 or so thousand people per week, and growing at a fast clip, if not obviously reaching the point of full lockdown, not before long. But the problem is, out of those 11,000 positive tests, it's using a technology that does not test for the disease state, COVID-19. It doesn't even test for the virus, SARS-CoV-2. It tests for a couple of pieces of genetic material, a couple of snippets, bits of RNA, one, two, maybe three max RNA snippets of the virus. And if it finds a positive match, it describes it as a positive test, we call it a case, job done. But the problem is, that is not a case. A medical definition of a case of any disease state has and will always be the expression of the diseased cluster of signs and symptoms. It's always been that way. And maybe we'd add it with a biological test if we have one, in this case, the PCR coronavirus test. But when we only use the coronavirus PCR test, we are hoodwinking the population. The WHO know that, and each and every government around the world know that. It is not testing for a live infection, it's not testing for viral load, it's not testing for transmissibility, it's simply testing for what is effectively a couple of viral RNA fragments. Let's see how that goes wrong, and let's combine that with the fact there is a false positive rate of this test. The false positive rate of the test is sounding re reasonable, say under 1%. Actually, some PCR test kits actually say they could be up to 5% false positives, but let's just go with 0.8% for argument's sake. Use that number, combine it with the hyper-testing surveillance we're seeing, combine that with the low prevalence that we have in our community, and you mathematically, statistically, very soundly, you can get to the point that you would deduce up to 90% of all, all positive test results, i.e. cases, are actually false results. Now, you can go and take a look at one of the links within the comments below to understand how we arrive at that statistic, but right here, right now, with this kind of testing regime, you can expect the majority of these positive tests to actually be false results. But let's walk through a microcosm of those 11,000 tests to understand how this translates to a much bigger issue than just this kind of exponentially looking case saga. So out of those 10 people, we'll have an individual that will be expressing serious symptoms related to COVID-19. It's picked up the SARS-CoV uh, viral fragments and together you would say, job done. We, we done the correct job with this test and this regime. The second person may have the SARS-CoV-2 virus intact. It may be live, it may be a live infection, but it's mild and or there are no symptoms. This individual, if they have symptoms, they recover quickly, they don't use the hospitals, they're not a particularly large vector of transmissibility. They're, they're a nothing really, but in this case, we'd grant it as an, an appropriate case. But everything thereafter is not a case. We might get a couple of individuals that basically have dead viral fragments in their bloodstream and in their mucus. Now, this is because they've had a past infection months ago, perhaps. They may or may not have known that, or they may have been coming in contact, which is very likely, with viral particles that include SARS-CoV-2 on a daily recurrent basis, and their body and immune system, as beautiful as it is, and as complex and evolved as it is, does its job of dismantling, disabling, and eliminating viruses that should not be present in the body. 
it keeps what it likes because we have lots of friends in the, in, in the bacteria and virus world. But the ones that are pathogenic, it finds a way to eliminate it. You don't even know it's happened. You're not transmitting anything. You're not causing a problem for the world and you don't have symptoms. And then the rest of them, say six of the 10, are probably false positives based on the current regime. And these false positives are not results at all. They are fake, completely fake. There's no viral fragments. It is just a, a, basically an artifact of a testing technology that when scaled, cracks. So we have these 10 individuals. Let's follow them through the, the, the system of, of data recording and see how it goes wrong. Now, this is the one true point where it does go right. This serious symptomatic individual with the, the positive test goes to the hospital. From the hospital, they log his details. That will pull back to the PCR testing database. It comes back saying, yes, they tested positive for COVID-19. That individual will get added to the COVID dashboard as a hospital admission. All good so far. If they progress to staying overnight, if they progress to the ICU, they'll get logged accordingly. And again, I would trust that data. That's absolutely fine. If that individual unfortunately passes, they will get logged into the all-cause death registration database. That too will pull the PCR testing database and it will return a positive result. That individual will be regarded as a COVID death, either with or of, and we will know the date of death as well as the date reported. All good so far. This is where it gets funky. Let's take this individual here. So they've got the dead viral fragment, past infection or their immune system just dealing with it beautifully without symptoms, but they have an accident, a road accident or something like that. Through that, they go to the A&E for treatment. They get logged onto the hospital record database. That polls the PCR testing database. The results come back. Yes, they've been tested. Yes, they are positive for COVID. That individual who's got a broken leg has no symptoms, doesn't express the disease, is now a COVID hospital admission. If he stays overnight, he becomes a hospital inpatient. And if he has a serious injury, he may actually be going into the ICU units, maybe onto me mechanical ventilators, who knows? And they, he too will be regarded as a COVID ICU bed use. If this person unfortunately dies, he too will go through the same process of all cause death registration, which will pull the PCR database will come back positive and as a result that individual that died of something completely unique and different from um, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 will be logged as a COVID death. Last case is someone who's got cancer and it's progressing um, to the point that it takes their life. Maybe they died at home, maybe they died in a care home or maybe they died within the hospital, it doesn't matter. The reality is though, he had a positive test, he has no signs and symptoms, he does not have the virus, he doesn't even have any dead viral fragments, it was a complete false positive, but he too will go through the process, will get logged as a COVID death. So can you see that if we get the cases wrong, we get the hospitalization data wrong, and we get the deaths wrong, all field, field, feed into the COVID dashboard, that dashboard that informs you, the media, the government, and creates panic and fear. If we've done one thing and one thing only, we can test until we're blue in the face, I really don't care. But we have to pull back from this urgency to test without the appropriate filter. And they can test millions a day, but if they keep it for their own scientific curiosity, I'm fine with that. You can test as much as you want, but only record COVID statistics. If that individual expresses the unique cluster of signs and symptoms relevant to COVID-19. Do that and 11 cases, 11,000 cases will go down to a fraction, an absolute fraction. And those hospital admissions will drop, the deaths would drop. And then we'd see the true effect of a winter resurgence, of a seasonal flu season. We expect to see a resurgence of COVID-19. We expect there to be more viral transmission of this pathogen and others. We expect to see a decline in health through the winter and some people sadly passing. These things happen every year. And right now we're trending to, for this to be an appropriate endemic um, curve, a wave, a small hump, shall we say. But it could escalate beyond that. And if it escalates beyond that, I don't know and you don't know if that is actually an issue. 
because we have this polluted data. I hope that makes sense, a little longer than I expected, but I think we really need to get a grasp of this and we need to demand reform so we can all understand if there is true risk, because trust me, if there is true risk, I wanna know about it, I wanna respond appropriately, and I don't wanna keep assuming everything is a lie. Fix it.